Welcome to You Are From God, where we open the Bible and learn to see the image of God in ourselves and the people around us. I'm Scott Taylor. And I'm Tyler Hall. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back today on You Are From God. Scott and I want to talk with you a little bit about being like Christ. Scott, this is a common idea that we find in the New Testament that once we understand who Jesus is as we're learning and growing as his disciples, really the goal can be summed up as being like Christ. Paul in many places will say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We talked last week in last week's episode of this podcast about the mission, the idea that our mission is to be transformed and to be like Christ, if we can use that connection to this episode, so that we can glorify God as spreading his word and and ultimately showing the world around us who this Jesus is. Yes, in our words, but certainly in our deeds and our behavior. And that's kind of the part we want to talk about a little bit today. Um, As we go to Matthew 9 to begin, there's just so many aspects of Jesus's character and the qualities that we're striving to emulate or be like. But I think first, Scott, the idea that that we have to really start with and kind of continue on as we are growing is the compassion and kindness of our Savior. I think that's the amazing thing about Jesus. We can talk about the miracles he did, which are amazing, his wisdom, all the things that he talked about, which is just awesome. But sometimes we overlook the things that we actually can do, which is the compassion to your point, the kindness, the seeing opportunities around us that that people um, are there and we can talk to them if, if needed. And I think about, as you did, about Matthew, and you think about his calling, and you may think, well, what's the big deal about it being Matthew or or Levi, as Luke will call him? Well, the reality is he was a tax collector, and there wasn't too many people that were going up and having friendly conversation with the tax collectors back then. They were viewed to be traitors most of the time because you had a Jewish man collecting money for the Roman Empire most of the time, and and that's a very um, difficult thing to get past for, for a lot of people, and Jesus goes up to him as verse 9 begins in chapter 9 of Matthew and says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth, and he said, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then he happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and the disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your tax, or excuse me, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But Jesus heard this and said, It is not those who are healthy who need physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. So to understand the picture of this, in in Luke's account we're told that Matthew throws a banquet for for Jesus. And you imagine who's going to be invited to these banquets that they would have had. Well, who was invited to Matthew's was tax collectors and sinners. And if that doesn't explain something to you about the way that the Jewish people at the time would have looked at tax collectors, they had their own uh, category of Mm -hmm. sin. And so it's a very difficult um, job that he had and how people were going to look at him. We see this very similar with Zacchaeus as an example. But Jesus looked at him and said, that's one of the guys that I want to follow me. I want to change him. I want him to be an apostle ultimately of mine, and he's going to go and spread the gospel to other people. And so he shows kindness to a man that nobody else shows kindness to and probably hadn't felt kindness for a long time. There's probably not too many people that went up to the tax collector booth, as it calls it, and had a nice little conversation with the man that was inside. But Jesus did. And not only did Jesus talk to him, which was amazing, he wanted him to follow him as one of his disciples. And I think there's so much that we can learn from this, Tyler, just from the standpoint of just being kind, not just to the people that we may view to deserve kindness or that are kind to us, but just be kind. Just be a kind person. We can talk about it from a cultural standpoint that this is an issue today. This has always been an issue. Um, We obviously see it here in the first century. I'm willing to show kindness to people that I deem worthy for my kindness rather than just showing kindness to people and understanding the compassion that we can have for somebody else just simply because they are made in God's image. They are just a human and we can have show kindness to them, show Jesus to them and understand that Jesus was willing to die for them. So the first thing, at least from this podcast, be kind like Jesus Christ was. Right. And that kindness, that compassion, feeling what somebody others feeling, um, being able to put yourself in their shoes. You know, Jesus was 
amazing at this. He deeply felt the needs and the hurt and the longing of people. He could obviously see their hearts as well. Um, and that led him to share a lot with them. He certainly, uh, as we've mentioned, provided some miracles to help with certain needs, but a lot of times it was just Jesus spending time and giving an ear and sharing his wisdom, obviously, from God, but sharing that with people. And so when we think about Jesus, we want to be generous like Christ, too. Jesus is fascinating to think about that, being generous like Christ, because from a worldly monetary standpoint, Jesus was not your Bill Gates or your Jeff Bezos or your Elon Musk. Like, he is, he's the poor. He's born to a carpenter. He's, he doesn't have a place to lay his head. It's all these things that the gospel revealed to us that Jesus was born into poverty, essentially, and he was not uh, from a family of means, and he doesn't acquire physical wealth, but he, with what he has, is immensely generous, which is just so fascinating. Here, when he calls Matthew, obviously he's generous with his time and his attention. You think about going into this banquet and Matthew introducing him to just everybody that he's invited, and that Jesus makes it clear to the Pharisees, these are the people that I came to call, that I'm here to spend my effort and my ministry calling back to God to redeem them. It's just so awesome to think about our Savior having that attitude. These people are worthy of my time. These people are somebody that I want to give to in that way. It reminds me, Scott, of 2 Corinthians, where Paul's teaching the church in Corinth how to be generous like Christ. If you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he talks about these churches in Macedonia who, it says, in a severe test of affliction in verse 2, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It's fascinating, verse 2, it talks about the wealth of generosity. It's not the wealth of physical means. They're wealthy in their generosity, which is a difference. We might think of those two as the same, but this is the wealthy generosity that we see in Jesus, even though he didn't have a lot of physical things. You go on in verse 3, For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. It's this powerful idea that when you are committed to Christ, when you're following him, you're going to be a selfless, generous giver like Christ was. Verse 9 uh, in the same chapter makes this point pretty clear. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, again, not talking in physical sense, but the spiritual aspect of being the Son of God, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. And that's the attitude that we're striving to have. We want to be generous because God has been so immensely generous with us. And so whether it's our physical means, we certainly have opportunities to do that. But no matter what the number in our bank account is, Scott, we can be generous with our time, with our attention, with our talents and our skills and abilities. We can give of ourselves to other people and be generous like our Savior was. It takes us to the next one, which is courage. And, and you think about whether it's Jesus going up to Matthew and his willingness to talk to him in front of other people. John, the fourth chapter with him talking at the woman at the well. And you, th and you can see Jesus and his courage. And it's because of his kindness, his love, his compassion, uh, his generosity, all these different things as the son of God that he was able to just exemplify so much for all of us. But there's also this piece where you see people around him that were showing courage, and it may just be a little bit different than the way that we normally look at it. And the reason why I want to bring this up this way in Luke, the seventh chapter, is that a lot of times we talk about courage in the scriptures, and we're talking about David going up against Goliath, or we're talking about um, these huge events, which are absolutely great examples of courage. Well, the reality is we're all going to show courage in our lives, and there's going to be different ways in which that's going to be seen for a lot of different people. And Luke, the seventh chapter in verse 36, Jesus is going to a um, banquet again. He's, he's going to be dining uh, with this time, though, with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees really are just having him there to try to catch him. They're just going to talk to him. And this woman finds out who the Bible refers to as a sinner. And this woman finds out that he's there. It says she's learned that he's there. So she knows a couple of things. She knows that the Pharisees are there because it's their house. But she also knows Jesus is there. And so she has a choice to make at this point, whether or not it's worth going to be in front of Jesus, in front of the Pharisees. She knew how the Pharisees would view her. She, I'm sure, had had run-ins with them before with the righteous um, leaders at the time. 
And so she had a choice to make, and she chooses not only to go and see where Jesus was, but to go in. And when she goes in, she shows this fruit of repentance by um, falling down before him. She had an alabaster vial of perfume. She was weeping at his feet, began to uh, wet his feet with her tears, and and kept wiping with her hair and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume, as verse 38 says. And then the Pharisees see this, obviously, and they say, Now when the Pharisees who had invited him in saw this, he said to, to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him that she is a sinner. And it goes on and Jesus tells this story, uh, the parable of the two debtors, and, and they certainly come to the conclusion of understanding who uh, the one is, and, and the fact that, again, Jesus came to save the sinners. But the uh, amazing thing to me, Tyler, is the courage of this woman to go in because she understood the value of Jesus. She knew she was going to be ridiculed. She's probably going to be ridiculed after all of this. But Jesus tells her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so she's going to have this peace, not because the circumstances of her life necessarily have changed or the Uh, things that she's done in her past have changed. What has changed, though, is that now she knows that she has been forgiven of her sins by Jesus Christ, and she can go in peace. She can have peace in the midst of chaos. She can have peace in the midst of reviling by the the people that were around her. And at least from my opinion, Tyler, this this lady's situation now doesn't get much better. Um, It does from a standpoint between her and Jesus, but you can imagine that the Pharisees are going to treat her horribly after this Mm -hmm. if she continues to be in that area. And that's the same thing for us. We got to have courage. Is God worth standing up for in certain situations? Or am I willing to show my faith, even if it's just between me and him, just me and him? Other people are going to say what they're going to say. But do I have the courage, as Jesus did and as his followers do, to make sure we understand the value of serving him and showing people that we serve him? All right. And and that's because we are walking like him and we're we're all in on Jesus, as we would say. It's it's not about what's most comfortable for me. It's not about how I can get the most from a worldly standpoint or progress myself to get other people to look at me. This is about truly being with Jesus, abiding in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to truly be invested in my relationship with God. And Scott, that's really the last piece we want to talk about as we close this episode, is the idea that Jesus was really good about being together. Obviously, he demonstrates how to have a harmony, a a good, solid union and a relationship with the Father. Uh, that he teaches us to have. He shows us how to have that relationship with other people. Again, back in Matthew 9, when he just simply says to Matthew, follow me. I mean, those two simple words have a profound impact on somebody who for their most adult life, you would assume is just being rejected left and right or being spit at or having his nose, having others' noses turned up at him. And now Jesus comes up to him and looks him straight in the eyes and say, I want you with me. That's a profound statement and we can understand why Matthew might stand up immediately even if it's leaving his job just stand up and follow this man and the fact that Jesus is together with the tax collectors and sinners later on at this banquet again he's not just sharing a meal with them he's sharing time he's sharing the gospel as he goes on to tell the Pharisees he's calling these people who are sick to repentance he's calling them to be healed by himself the great physician Matthew 11, later on in this book, will basically say it this way as Jesus is teaching. The invitation and follow me is now echoed here when he says, come to me in verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This Scott, quite frankly, is the invitation for each and every one of us today. The gospel of Christ that's been fulfilled by his death, burial, and resurrection. That gospel that's been proclaimed by those like Matthew and the other apostles that have been written down for our benefit so that we can obey this gospel and live in it and live by it. This is the invitation. Jesus says, I want to be with you. We can be together like Christ when we are together with Christ. And if you're listening to this and you have questions about how that happens, how the Bible says that we can be with Christ, we would love the opportunity to talk with you. If you just want to reach out to us through one of our means of contact that you'll hear in just a moment, please reach out to us and contact us. We would love to teach you these things so that we can all be like Christ, so that we can embrace this idea that we are from God. Thanks for listening. 
Show your support by leaving a review on your podcast app and share this episode with someone you want to encourage. If you have questions or would like to get in touch with us, go to youarefromgod.com. That's youarefromgod.com.